Hi, happy Halloween month. And in this video, we are going to explore the origin of each famous Halloween costumes like vampires, werewolves, and some other interesting ones. I'm not going to talk much about why we wear costumes on Halloween now. That's the topic for the next video I'll publish around Halloween. The next video will also cover things like why are sexy Halloween costumes a thing? So you can leave some questions you have about Halloween costumes here. I will try to answer to the best of my ability. For now, let's enjoy this boogie journey together. When we talk about vampires, we are likely to think of those suave gentlemen or ladies who live in a castle with noble air clinging around them. However, vampires in the old days were not this attractive. They were supposed to be normal corpses that wake up and drink people's blood, so what changed? Why are vampires depicted with these charming suits, capes, fangs, and with some bat and coffin motif? Dracula though not the first aristocratic vampire, is the best known example. The most iconic vampire of all time is Bela Lugosi's Dracula in 1931, adapted from Bram Stoker's Dracula novel in 1897. This serves as the inspiration for many vampire costumes. Many of you might already know that Bram Stoker took inspiration for Count Dracula from Vlad III of Romania, commonly known as Vlad the Impaler. But what you may not know is that Stoker also took inspiration from vampire books prior to his, such as Vampire by John Willem Polidori in 1819 and Camilla by Sheridan Le Fanu in 1872. Lord Ruthven in the book Vampire is the very first suave and attractive vampire, as he was described as a noble man with dead grey eyes and a magnetic demeanour that easily charms ladies. Camilla is also described as an unearthly, beautiful and seductive vampire. With many vampires being wealthy and attractive, this image was deeply ingrained in people's mind, especially after Bela Lugosi's repeated appearances throughout many films. Now, we know where the suit came from, but why the cape? We have to give this credit to Bela Lugosi's look for this one. When Lugosi acted as Dracula in the stage play, the cape along with the high collar allowed him to disappear behind the trapdoor easily, creating an illusion of a sudden disappearance. He continued to wear this cape in the film adaptations as well. Now, what do we have left? Ah, right, the fangs, bats and coffins. Originally, the two fangs were not really the mandatory for vampires. The first vampire in fiction portrayed with two canines was Varney from the book Varney the Vampire, written by James Malcolm Reimer and Thomas Peckett Prest in 1845. And the first vampire sleeping in a coffin was the notorious female vampire Camilla. Dracula, again, takes the credit for the bat theme. He was the first vampire to turn into a bat, and this characteristic was also conveyed in the film adaptations. Now, here you go. This is why vampire costumes include a suit, a cape, a pair of fangs, and some bat and coffin themes. I put a spell on you. And now you're mine. One of the top Halloween costumes everyone would think of is none other than a witch costume. The costumes sold are usually black dresses with a witch hat and a broom. More often than not, people would put on green skin makeup to make them look like a classic evil witch. Despite the fact that witches nowadays are not depicted in such a way anymore, since they are influenced by modern Wiccan religion or witch core fashion, we can't deny that the witch doodles and drawings are still green witches with pointy hats. One of the most iconic witches in pop culture is the Wicked Witch of the West from The Wizard of Oz. The witch was not described as having green skin in the original version of the book, this look with green skin was from the movie adaptation in 1939 and has influenced so many witches in pop culture afterwards. But the rest of the outfit has longer history than that, especially the witch hat. There are three main explanations for where these pointed brim hats come from. One is a Jew hat from around the 11th century, another is from the Quakers hat in the 17th century, and the third one is from the alewives of the medieval period. Let's explore how each hat is linked to witchcraft. One of the decisions taken by the medieval church during the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 was for the Jews, who were believed to practice witchcraft, to wear a little pointed cap known as Jew hats. Well, anything they deemed non-Christian was all the village of witchcraft in that era. 
Jew hat was the way for them to distinguish Jews from Christian. Another origin of the witch hats was from the Quakers of the mid 1600s to 1800s, who faced prejudices by the Puritans during the 18th century. The hats were not necessarily pointy, but they are quite identical to modern witch hats. Lastly, let's talk about the alewives, who were female brewers, possibly from 1300s onwards to 1700s. Well, any independent female was controversial in that era anyway, so they were often linked with pagan practices. And the last part for the witch costumes, the witch brooms. There were illustrations of pagan practices with brooms, mostly to encourage the crops to grow, but it was later seen as an evil thing. Many explained that the, a witch was often seen with a broom because it emphasized the stereotype that witchcraft was a woman thing. Now, for those who are too lazy to dress up but still need to show up at a Halloween party somehow, the easiest costume that you could wear that wouldn't raise any eyebrows is the bedsheet ghost costume. But why a ghost in a bedsheet? During Shakespeare's era, ghosts were portrayed wearing outdated outfits, especially in armour, to show that this character was not from that era. This is why Hamlet's father is often depicted in a suit of armour in historical depictions. Later on, people needed costumes that allowed ghost characters to disappear quietly. So what could be better than flowing white shrouds? This concept was inspired by how common or poor people buried bodies in the early modern period with white trousers wrapped over the body rather than in a coffin. The famous technique used together with a white shroud or bedsheet ghost is the pepper ghost technique. Pepper ghost is an optical illusion technique reflecting hidden objects to create ghostly images. John Henry Pepper used this method to project a seated skeleton covered in a white shroud onto a stage around 1860s. This marked the beginning of Pepper's ghost widespread use in theatres, haunted house, and theme park attractions. The reason why this costume went global can be traced back to the animation Lonesome Ghost, where Mickey Mouse, Goofy, and Donald Duck encounter bedsheet ghost. Another iconic character contributing to this trend is, you guess it, Casper the Friendly Ghost in 1945. I don't know how, and I don't know why, pirates have become a popular costume choice for Halloween, but here we are. But I must say, from my research, that the typical pirate costume is not terribly historically inaccurate, except for the sexy ones, of course. It's important to note that there is no historical pirate costume, so to say, since pirates mainly wore typical seamen attire. Pirate captains might have owned some slightly fancier items, but that's it. The depictions of pirates even during the Golden Age of Piracy, um, 1650 to 1726, were based on descriptions and a tiny bit of imagination. Howard Pyle, born in 1894, was a painter who drew quite a lot of number of pirates and has inspired many modern pirate looks. And I must say, he did draw plenty of charming and fancy captains, as well as a crew member typical white shirt, red sash and loose pants style. Now let's take a look at typical pirate Halloween costumes and compare it to the historical ones. We often see two types of pirate costumes, one for the captains and one for the crew members. The captain costume often include a tricorn hat and embroidered long jacket. For the crew, they wear headband, silk, sash, and striped shirt or pants. An eye patch can be paired with both the captain outfit and the crew's outfit. For pirate captain looks, most costume stores sell costumes identical to Captain Hook, Jack Sparrows, and Long John Silver from the Trisha Island. Let's talk about the most iconic item first, the pirate tricorn hat. The tricorn hats were formed the cavalier hats worn by the Swedish officials and soldiers during the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648. And after that, the hat was adopted as a part of military and marine uniform in several neighboring countries. However, the brim of the hat isn't really practical in the seas, so they pin the brim up, forming a triangular shape. Apart from tricorns, you might have seen seamen, especially officials, wearing a bicorn as well. This has the same principle as a tricorn, but the brim is pinned in a different way. Here are some iconic hats from the pirate captains in history. 
Bartholomew Roberts was known for wearing a feathered hat. William Kidd was often drawn wearing a tycorn hat or, or a cavalier hat, and though Steed Bonnet is usually seen with a long wig without a hat, there is a picture on Cigarette Card from 1888 of him sporting a bicorn as well. The next crucial item for the captains is an extravagant long coat. Since long coats are not really practical for sea travel, most seamen didn't wear them. Well, it's not like they could afford an expensive coat unless they plundered it from other wealthy ships anyway, but it's not like there were no people who wanted to show off their wealth. Apart from Captain Hook's red coat, Bartholomew Roberts, yes, that one with feathered hats, was often seen wearing a red coat, earning the French nickname of Le Jory Rouge. Now that we have the captain's checklist off, let's go to the crew members' costumes. Seamen often wore a wool monmouth cap, which looks rather close to the headbands in modern costumes, and they did wear silk sashes, but they might not always be worn around their waist, but across the shoulder, to hold their pistols or to keep their folded knives. In the world of daring adventures, lost limbs and eyes were not uncommon. Captain Long John Silver was renowned for his leg peg. There is no historical evidence, but some pirates might have worn eye patches either to conceal their missing eyes or adapt to darkness. As to reason why many pirates' costumes are designed with stripes, we could link this to a typical marine uniform with stripes called a marinier or a matelot. It kind of makes sense, considering many pirates were mutineers. They claim that the striped shirt makes it easier to spot an overboard seaman. I don't know if this is real or not, I haven't run an experiment myself. Now, let's get back to something more supernatural. Stereotypical devil costumes are in red with horns, goatees, bat wings, and a trident. First, let's see where the red came from. I mean, I get it, red is blood, red is evil, but the devils in medieval paintings were not even red. The root of the pop culture's red devil is Mephistopheles in Faust's illustration. Many advertisements also drew devils in red with goatees, but what popularized the modern idea of red devil could be from Disney devils in Hell's Bells. And since we mentioned goatee, let's discuss why devils have goat-like features. The most likely theory is that the goat-like features derive from a Greek god, Pan, the god of fertility, the wild and rustic music. Pan is known for his sexual prowess and sexual abandon, so which pagan god could be more perfect to blame than a god relating to Amorous Congress? That is why devil horns are nothing new. There were many illustrations from the medieval period depicting devils with horns. Similarly, bat wings are not really a new invention for devil design. Bats, being a nocturnal creatures, have long been linked to darkness in contrast to angels' pure white feathered wings. The devil pitchfork, however, has no obvious answer as to how and why it is included in a costume. Some people propose that the devil was supposed to be portrayed with a trident, the symbol of Poseidon, a pagan god in Christian belief, and it was later changed to a pitchfork due to… I don't know, maybe it was easier to explain to ordinary people that way? A pitchfork gives off a vibe of herding evil souls like how human herd animals, so I guess that's a plus. We can't leave out Frankenstein's monster when talking about Halloween costumes. And thank god this costume origin is way easier to track. A square head with scars, green skin and screws on its neck. These features are all from 1931's Frankenstein, with Boris Karloff as the actor. This design was created by Jack Pierce, and Universal owned the rights to this exact look. That's why we still occasionally see grey-skinned Frankenstein's monster, like in the 2004 film Van Helsing. But you will still be able to see this makeup in other films like The Munsters, since this movie is also owned by Universal. Some of you might feel curious about why they decided to make Frankenstein's monster green in a black and white film. The answer is that, due to the color sensitivity of the film material used in the 1930s, certain tints of green appeared on screen as ghostly white, distinguishing Frankenstein from other human characters. And I guess when they copyrighted the look, they needed to copyright the whole look, including the green skin. And for those who wonder, 
how Mary Shelley Frankenstein's author described the monster in the book. Here is how she described it. His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful, beautiful, great God. His yellow screen scarcely covered the work of muscle and arteries beneath. His hair was of a lustrous black and flowing. His teeth of a pearly whiteness, luxuriances only form a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes, and seem almost of the same colour as the dun white sockets in which they were set, his shriveled complexions and straight black lips. Not too long ago, the alien abduction outfit was so popular across the internet. But why are aliens always this green guy? This alien could be a combination of two alien tropes, the little green man and the greys. The phrase little green man was coined after the Kelly Hopkinsville encounter in America, in which two Kentucky men described an encounter with a metallic silver, slightly humanoid looking aliens, no taller than 4 feet, 1.2 meter. The term Little Green Man was used in the news by Evansville Courier and Press. Another famous green alien in fiction that helped make green skin aliens popular was Edgar Rice Burroughs' A Prince of Mars Green Alien. Despite the fact that these three meter, despite the fact that these three meter tall aliens are not exactly little. Meanwhile, the balloon-shaped head, small body, big eyes, and grey skin are characteristics of aliens called the Greys. The Barney and Betty Hill incident is a well-known Grey's case. The couple claimed that they were abducted by alien from the September 19 to 20, 1961, in New Hampshire, and the alien they encountered resembled humans with black hair, dark eyes, prominent noses, bluish lips, and grey skin. Their story was also adapted into the best-selling 1966 book the Interrupted Journey, and the 1975 television film The UFO Incident. Aside from this case, one of the very first stories depicting aliens with a balloon head is A Tale of the Future, which featured a small grey alien with a balloon-shaped head. Invasion of the Saucerman is a classic film that combined the looks of the little green men and the greys as well as the Mekon from Eagle Comic. Similarly, the book Den Okenda Fahan, The Unknown Danger by Gabriel Lind described the alien as short, bald-headed, and with large eyes. Apart from the green alien's look, alien Halloween costumes often feature shiny metallic fabrics, a style heavily inspired by the 1960s space race era vision of the future. Designers like Pierre Cardin played a significant role in shaping the revolutionary and metallic fashion trends. A zombie outfit is not really a fixed one. You just need to wear clothes stained with blood and put on some makeup that makes you look like a corpse that just arose from the dirt. But are we done here? Absolutely not. We haven't discussed the elephant in the room. Why are so many zombies green? The iconic zombie movie like The Walking Dead zombies are pale or greyish, not green. There are some speculations about this, but I haven't found any concrete answer. Some could say that zombies are green because green represents something rotten, or zombies are linked to Frankensteins since they are both corpses coming back to life. I have also found people saying that the colour green was substituted for red in early video games because the gamers in some countries were not fans of spurting red blood streams. I'm not sure if they are referring to Mortal Kombat or some other games. One of the earliest green zombie reference is the film White Zombie in 1932. With this very notable green poster, still I'm not sure if this is the one that popularized the idea of zombies being green or not. Well, though the zombie's skin tone is not that easily traced, the brain theme has a clear origin. While most zombies in film eat whatever flesh they could reach, the movie that sparks the trends of zombie eating brain is The Return of Living Dead in 1985. Dan O'Bannon, writer and director of the movie, commented that zombies feast on brains of the living to alleviate pain. This led to many zombie-themed products with, with a brain in the design. And yup, that's why zombies are green and eat brains, I guess? Now, 
here's the last outfit for today, the werewolves. At first, I didn't think there would be a specific werewolf look. I thought that the costume would be just people wearing wolf mascots or wearing wolf masks or something like that. And how I hate how wrong I was. Because when I searched for werewolf costumes, there were plenty of werewolf costumes wearing red plaid flannels and jeans. Why? In pop culture, there are several werewolves who wear a flannel. Universal Wolfman, for example, is seen in a plain green shirt. In The Nightmare Before Christmas, the werewolf wears an orange plaid. Still, there are several werewolves who did not wear flannel, such as Remus Lupin from Harry Potter who wandered around naked, or Jay Fox from Teen Wolf who wore little man jackets. More importantly, from these werewolves that wore flannel, none of them wore a red plaid. The best explanation could be that a red flannel is a great representation of common people, and it is linked to the wilderness Originated from Wales, flannel fabric gained popularity in Europe for its durability and warmth. Flannel shirts made their way to America in the 19th century and became essential attire for soldiers and labourers. And there is also a reason why this specific red flannel shirt is one of the most iconic fashion items in the history. Plate patterns, known as tartan, have been a part of Celtic culture since the 6th century BC, each pattern representing a specific region of the weaver. One reason why this pattern is so popular in America is due to the mythical giant Paul Bunyan, an American and Canadian folk hero dressed in a red plate flannel shirt. His heroic tales inspired many workmen, as particularly lumberjacks. Red flannel is not only popular in America but also in Canada. The introduction of the red shirt to Canada is attributed to Jock McCluskey, believed to be a descendant of Rob Roy MacGregor, a Scottish outlaw and folk hero, and now it has become a stereotypical look for Canadians who are stereotyped as living in the woods. So people might start to give this red flannel shirt to werewolves to give off that layman and forest vibe. And there you go, the origin of the costumes of vampire, witches, ghosts, pirates, devils, Frankenstein's monsters, aliens, zombies, and werewolves. So, do you have an idea now of what you want to dress up as this Halloween? Do you have other characters you want to dress up as? Please share in the comment section. And I hope you have a very fun and spooky Halloween month. Phew, I was genuinely invested in the research and writing process, but Dear, the script turned out to be much longer than I expected. But well, at least this is fun. Anyway, I hope you have an amazing time. As always, see you on the next journey.